Okay. So this is the first of, um, uh, inshallah, three session series that we're going to look at um, what a man, what basically what the relationship between man and ma'ad is, right? And ma'ad here meaning the hereafter. Um, so I'm just opening up the cam, the screen the method that I can see some of your videos, whose videos are on. And that way, inshallah, I could benefit from your expressions as well. Okay. So there is a there is a uh, initial misconception that starts to take place, and um, and we think that um, okay, it's we understand tawhid, uh, adl, nabuwat, imamat, and qiyamat, and, and the Sarbadif system, and we kind of engrave this as basically we as the Shias and um, our, our our Sunni brothers we share in. Uh, many of these fundamentals of the faith, the belief system, and um, one thing we don't don't recognize is that our understanding, our fundamental understanding of ma'ad, our fundamental understanding of the hereafter, is entirely dependent on how we understand our tawhid to be, and entirely dependent on how we understand our nabuwat to be, and entirely dependent upon how we understand our imamat to be, right? And then once basically something changes in a person's belief system in their tawheed or at the level of nabuwat or at the level of imamat, right? Then so does uh, basically that, that results in a fundamental change in how they perceive and understand ma'ad or qiyamat to be as well, right? So um, right from the get-go, when we're talking about these fundamental belief systems, right, our approach is always two-pronged. It's always uh, based on the aql and the naql. So what we hope to cover, inshallah, through this particular series uh, of three lectures is uh, looking at um, looking at ma'ad, uh, looking at uh, ma'ad. So we'll cover basically a, 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 a good introduction about, about what, the, the, what the soul of basically man is like, what, what, uh, what the human body and the human spirit and soul is like. Uh, what the views are in terms of uh, how we look at that based on our ahadis. And um, we go forward then and then see that what relationship does that have with our faculties that we have. Um, then we talk about concepts like what is a maleke, what is an attribute that we can make and create within us. Right? We also have, we're going to talk about something called the realms of existence and the difference between this world uh, uh, and then the, and the barzakh and and perhaps even qiyamah if we get to it, okay? And we're going to talk about the relationship of this world and the hereafter, uh, and so on and so forth. So basically how the how the recording of the deeds is done in this dunya, what is the time of when a person is passing away, when there's a separation from this world and moving on to the hereafter, this time is called ihtidhar, right? And what is it? What does it mean? How, how to look at it? How is it described in our ahadith, and how does it benefit or affect me? Like, why why is it knowing about it so important? Okay, uh, does it have stages or not? Um, why is it so important to know and talk about this idea of angel of death, and if I will see him or not, and so on and so forth? Right. Um, we hope to cover other things as well, such as barzakh, uh, such as qiyamah, such as the sirat, and then accounting, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, Inshallah, through the course of the, the three sessions, we hope to cover all nine items. So in today's session, I'm hoping to reach up till ihtidhar. So we're going to go through the introduction, introduction one, two, um, point number three there and four, and then inshallah up to ihtidhar, if not covering portions of it as well. Uh, let's see um, how far we end up getting. Okay, so... See in um, in various uh, in in various um, ways of studying how man is right both in the east and the west right people came up with different theories of of how a man is so in certain philosophies of the west um, uh, people came up with theories that basically uh, a man might not have dual existence rather he might not have a soul and a body but rather might just be the body entirely and no aspect called the soul. Right. 
other people came and said well maybe it's just the mind and then the that the mind and everything else like the body and the soul interactions we have and so on and so forth they are basically the the creation of this mind and then and then man uh, is composed of just that and and there are other views there that are, that are, that are there as well and and someone can study um, these different views in 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 a more in a more detailed manner in certain sciences like epistemology or in San Shanasi and so on and so forth, right? The Islamic view of looking at what a human being is also had uh, multiple uh, multiple opinions in it as well, right? Amongst the Islamic scholars, um, there was this idea that uh, that the human being is composed composed of based on a hadith and uh, and the text of the Holy Quran, right? Is composed of a body, right? And then the human being uses his soul, right, which is his second component, to basically commit actions through this particular body, right? So then the soul ends up becoming like a driver, and the body is like that car, which the driver is sitting in, and the driver, the soul, uses this particular body, this particular car now, to, you know, turn right and turn left and go straight and so on and so forth, right? Uh, but in, in this particular view, the soul and body were quite distinct. They weren't, uh, I mean, the soul was the driver and the car, and the, and the body was the car and a car is not a driver and the, and the driver is not a car. They're two different things, right? Existentially, they're different. Then um, recently, now recently meaning Mullah Sadra's time, so it's not as recent, but um, when Mullah Sadra came about, um, he's a philosopher and uh, he's an Islamic philosopher, right? He comes about and he gives an opinion of, um, of based on Again, uh, philosophy as well as the uh, understanding of our hadith and understanding of our of the verses of the Holy Quran, uh, and says that well, so the human being, this 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 uh, this analogy of a car and the driver. Okay, let's keep the analogy for a second. So we have somebody who uh, we have our soul, and our soul is using the body to commit actions and so on and so forth. But it's not that there's no existential link between them. Right? Rather, there actually is an existential link now between that soul and the body as well. Right? Where, where, so it's not that the body and the soul are entirely different things uh, and, and so on and so forth, but rather there is a small connection there. Now our soul, so, so these were the two opinions that I wanted to share with you. One was the Sinavi opinion. The second one was the Sadrai opinion. Um, you could write those terms down if you want, but the terms aren't important. The content and the concepts are. So uh, in the one opinion, basically, the car driver and the car were two entities distinct, not having a relationship with, with each other. And the second opinion, now that car driver and the car did have a relationship too. But both opinions held uh, true to this idea that the human being was composed of a soul and a body. Okay. Now, um, this soul has, or this soul now has certain faculties to it. So by experience, we know certain some of these faculties. We know the faculty of intellect. So through experiential knowledge, we have this understanding that um, we experience that we have this faculty called the intellect. We have this faculty called desire, right? And then we have this faculty called anger, right? So um, there exists also a fourth faculty, which is the imaginative faculty. We won't get into that so, so much. But... Um, we experientially see that we have this faculty of desire and we have this faculty of anger, right? So um, desire here, not just meaning that, um, uh, like desire meaning just like a general term for wanting things. So if I want pizza, I desire to eat pizza, right? So we will, this is called shahwa uh, uh, in, in, in the text in Arabic, um, but I'll translate it as desire here for now, right? And anger would be ghadab, but I've put it as anger here for now. So this body, um, basically the soul is using this particular body and, and making all these actions, right? Um, uh, it's, it's committing all these actions, but there's these actions also kind of uh, go back and affect the soul as well then. So for example, um, if I take, uh, if I take um, um, my soul, basically the ones, I use my soul to go and binge eat, um, uh, basically, pizza and, and not exercise and keep myself away from the gym and so on and so forth, right? My, it, 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 I use that body to do all this. So my soul is making the decision, which is that I'm, I'm not going to let this body exercise and lift weights and go to the gym and so on and so forth, right? 
and and I end up not doing that. So my body doesn't move that much, and I'm just basically a couch potato. Let's say I do that, and then this body starts to get some effect in it. It starts to get fatter and and uh, becomes very unhealthy, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, this action of mind that this body performed has a relationship and has an effect on the soul as well. So uh, this idea of becoming more lazy, being um, giving into my anger more, being prone to commit anger more than now there could be. Uh, there could be certain changes in the physical body itself that might lead to that. But ultimately, the soul also gets affected, right? And the soul starts to develop certain tendencies as well towards the desire and towards the anger and so on and so forth. So when a person is committing actions and performing actions by means of the body, right? Using his soul, right? So it's it's a give and take relationship. I mean, the soul is using the body to commit actions, but some of these actions, if not all, also have a relationship going back to the soul itself too. So the soul had uh, multiple faculties in it. So the soul had the faculty of intellect, it had the faculty of desire, and it had the faculty of anger. Right, The three um, major faculties of the four that we're talking, talking about. Right, the, the fourth faculty, the imaginative faculty, we won't be talking about it for now. We're just sticking to these three for this session. So so what's the job of, of, of these three faculties? Well, these three faculties uh, are, 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 are drivers and motivation givers for that particular soul to now use the body to commit an action. If they didn't exist, uh, if these faculties just weren't there, right? that motivation, that drive wouldn't be there for the soul to go ahead and commit that particular action. Right? If I didn't feel hunger and I didn't have the desire towards you know, filling my tummy and, um, and I didn't have basically um you know any 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 uh, attraction towards this you know let's say a beautiful pizza in front of me right and i would not go forward towards eating it because there would be no driving force i don't feel hungry uh, uh i don't actually i don't have the feeling of hunger at all right my body doesn't isn't able to tell me that i need this food and at the same time there's no uh, external attraction either towards this this item that exists before me that's called a, like a nice pizza right so there's no motivation there now for my my soul to come and use his body to go and grab a slice and eat it, for example, to quench that particular hunger or that, or that, that particular feeling that's existed within me called the hunger. Right? So if I take the faculty away, I'm taking away a drive, a, 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 a huge motivation and driver towards a lot of actions, if not all actions. Right? So um, every action that we have uh, has certain motivations and certain drivers behind it. right? And um, uh, predominantly speaking, it comes back to either our intellect or our desire or our anger, right? And then the desire, and then basically the, the driver behind those actions ends up becoming one of these three things. So, what the purpose of, um, uh, and it's, it's, what a purpose of, uh, of, of each one of these faculty now is, is that each one of them wants to be in control. So, I have my intellectual faculty, right? Uh, in, in this, in this, understanding this introduction of the of the of how islamic uh, how the islamic worldview regarding how what a human is um, basically uh, what the intellectual faculty's purpose is to maintain the balance of the desire faculty and the anger faculty right to not sway one way or the other now here on the powerpoint you see there's like uh, like, like like almost like a teeter totter right there's like one side and the other side and there's a, like a middle point a circle in the middle point right that's not quite exactly how you're balancing imagine like a better way to say is, let's say you have a 3D, three-dimensional, uh, let's, let's say you have a sphere, right? And then you have the midpoint of that particular sphere, right? So now you're trying to balance, uh, uh, basically, uh, let's say uh, something that's that, 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 that's with the slight movement of that sphere, right? There's a, let's say there's a fixed point called the balance point. And then you're trying to make sure this sphere stays uh, such that the midpoint of this particular sphere, sphere kind of, stays exactly on that that area where the, the the existential midpoint exists and now the slightest movement in any direction is going to cause uh, that that sphere to tilt away from that particular mid midpoint and by tilting away from that particular midpoint you're now creating an imbalance in that particular faculty so in fact what's happening is is that your intellect is um, your intellect is um, trying to maintain a balance within our desire or our anger and so on and so forth. But uh, with the deviation from that particular midpoint, it's, it's, it's swaying one way or the other. Right? 
and then uh, these the sway of one way or the other or to stay on the midpoint is uh, something that creates certain attributes and certain um, sifat within us. So for example, let's take the faculty of anger. Let's take the faculty of anger. If I sway one way, right? If I sway um, one way, uh, or if I sway the other way, right? I'm I'm in fact creating within me. Uh, either I'm becoming very very aggressive and very anger prone and and you know a, a violent human being, right? Or on the other way, I'm being somebody who is basically spineless, like like the greatest dolm in the world could be going on, and this person just doesn't wanna. You know, uh, doesn't have any emotions towards that, right? So, uh, in either way, you're 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 not leading, you're not leading that balanced uh, approach towards this particular faculty. It's not doing its purpose that it was supposed to do, right? Then your intellect comes in and tries to make sure that um, this sway doesn't happen, and it balances this particular faculty that when you're going through your twenty four hours, right, uh, the the various things that happen, you act appropriately. So let's say somebody uh, looks at you or says something rude to you and something 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 upsetting to you, you know, uh, you, you you neither turn the other cheek and say please you know abuse me more, nor do you you know um, you know do something something extreme and start you know have picking a fight with them and so on and so forth where it's not appropriate to pick a fight. <clears throat> so uh, intellect basically comes and tries to uh, maintain that balance between anger. Uh, from the from the two sides now the two sides shown here but i said a better analogy would be like that sphere analogy where there's multiple dimensions to consider it's not always a linear thing right um, you know, within our relationships within our uh, within our 24 hours we, we we know that we know that that things are seldom very linear there's often multiple dimensions to a particular scenario right and i have to consider all those dimensions as well when i'm actually going and trying to make sure that, I'm, that my response is a balanced response right just like how in every scenario there's different uh, dimensions to consider different layers to kind of consider when i'm making a decision of how i should react or act in a particular scenario well that's my intellect doing that right that's my intellect trying to find that balance point within the, the different realms and layers and so on and so forth that exist there why is this talk so important and why is it so important to talk about this particular uh, issue well first and foremost um, it's important that our intellect balances these balances these faculties because this is how we're shaping ourselves at the end of the day uh, i remember we talked about this idea that that um that we are uh, that a human is composed of both a soul and a body right and then the soul is used to make act to, to basically it's like the driver and then the car exists and the car is you know used to drive straight right left and so on and so forth right well the driving of this particular car is shaping how that driver ends up becoming. If, the, if this car runs into a tree, the driver isn't going to survive, right? It's going it's to have a lot of damage and problems and so on and so forth, right? So um, what, this, what this body ends up doing, the actions this body ends up doing and committing, right, has significant impact on this particular driver, this particular soul. So, uh, so to answer the question of why this is important, well, this is important because um, we want to make sure that when we're going through our 24 hours, um, when we're going through our 24 hours, uh, we are um, uh, uh, progressing in a manner in which our soul, the 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 thing which is extremely important to us, right? Because uh, this is a thing that we that that lives on that has eternity associated with it. It's eternal, right? This doesn't take on any risks or any damages, and if it has taken on damages, we correct it before it's too late. We correct that particular damage, or we correct or mitigate those risks before we are eternally basically um, bound to those um, consequences. <laughs> Excuse me. And the second why is it so important, which is uh, why is this talk why it's so important on the first session, this particular you know, introduction is because when we're talking about ma'ad and we're talking about the hereafter, right? It's the hereafter of the human being, right? So it's extremely important to understand that the hereafter of the human being, we first have to understand what a human being is. So once we understand how we are and what the Islamic worldview regarding how a human being should be is, right? Then only can we now um, take that information, go forward and see like how does these 
these things that, that exist in the Islamic worldview of a human being, right? How do they kind of fit in with this understanding of the belief system that Islam has towards Ma'ad? Are you going to kind of map those two together appropriately? So we talked about faculties. We talked about this idea of, you know, by free will controlling these desires, like making sure that it's balanced, not doesn't go to one animalistic side or the other, right? Making sure our anger is balanced, not doesn't go to one side or the other in situations within the 24 hours. So now uh, this particular concept, how does it link with, well, what Ma'ad is, right? So... Um, th this understanding of uh, of, of understanding uh, this understanding of um, how a human is in the Islamic worldview is important to basically have as an introduction before we get into the other portions of Ma'at. Okay. So, by by uh, by controlling our desire and by controlling our anger and making that them kind of uh, balance at that midpoint at the center point, right? We are then. Um, uh, creating, as I said, certain traits about us, right? Some traits might be positive traits if the balance is maintained, right? And, and if you're at that midpoint, right? So, for example, if you maintain the balance in your anger faculty, then you create the trait of bravery within you, right? And then um, sometimes if you uh, if you are in an imbalance in the in the trait of anger for example if, you, if, you're, if you're faculty of anger you have an imbalance imbalancement there if it's the one extreme you become somebody who's violent and so somebody who is like you know aggressive you get you have an aggressive trait to you right and then as i said if you have uh, the, the imbalance in the other direction right and you have not enough uh, uh, usage of this particular faculty then you could be somebody who is basically a coward so we don't, or somebody who is basically, you know, has has other issues uh, in in terms of bravery, like someone who's not brave. Right? So um, let's go forward. The, so let's so this this concept we had of like maintaining that balance between anger and uh, b b between the faculty of anger to prevent it from going one way or the other and kind of keeping at the midpoint, right? Um, the persistent maintenance of our faculty in that position slowly starts to create an attribute about itself so it's like it's like we, we, our soul learns uh, you know how our body has muscle memory so when you go work out and you if you work out at lower weights in a, in a gym per se let's say and you maintain good form right you you kind of build that form into your body you know exactly like you you kind of build that particular form into the muscle group that you're trying to work with right you create muscle memory regarding that particular action and you kind of feel and you know exactly what angle it should be at and you kind of feel that, right? You know, how, how, how particular movement should be, okay? Our soul has a similar trait, right? So if you take an attribute, like let's say bravery, and you're able to maintain that faculty within your 24 hours uh, for, a specific, for a duration of time, right? If you, if you persist in, in maintenance of that particular sifat, that particular attribute for your nafs, Right, for your soul, um, for the sake of this course, that we'll be talking about them as the same thing, right? Then all of a sudden, um, you're creating within you something called a malake, right? You're creating within you something that is basically um, an existential trait. So it's it's something that is extreme. It's it's something that uh, slowly starts to so you know that PowerPoint paint paint tool brush. That if you hold it down, it kind of like you know darkens and darkens and darkens and darkens and so on and so forth. Uh, not a PowerPoint, uh, a, a Microsoft Paint or a normal Paint software. There's like a there's like a spray tool brush that you use, right? And then basically, you hold it down and uh, sprays a little bit. And if you keep holding it down, it gets darker and darker and darker and darker. Well, as you're trying to maintain a balance in your faculty, faculty of anger, faculty of desire, by means of your intellect in an aware manner, right? You're creating now within you this attribute. You're creating now within you this malake, right? And then this malake existentially becomes part of your soul. Right? Existentially, you become a brave person, right? So you display bravery, you display bravery, you display bravery, and slowly, 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 you start to become a brave person, right? And then this malake comes and becomes part of you, is who you are. And this is what we want. We want you so you so if you, you want good traits to become part of you. The same can happen for negative traits as well. So if you display you display cowardice, you display cowardice, you display cowardice, and you slowly start to become a coward, right? 
Um, and then basically um, you display uh, irrational behavior, you display irrational behavior, and slowly, slowly you become an irrational person, right? So those one, in, those few instances of action that you start to commit, they start to take form um, in your existence, in your soul. Basically, your 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 soul starts to take those on. So they cast a shadow that was in here on your soul, right? Then your soul starts to mold uh, uh, in a particular manner by means of this particular malikin, this particular attribute that it started to gain now slowly, slowly, right? And again, I, I wanted to point out this progression and this and this and this gradation in this particular formation of this malaki. This is important. So um, uh, we have something in the Islamic paradigm called taqwa. Taqwa is um, the fear of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to hold on to Allah in my 24 hours. So not selling Allah short, meaning that I am not going to sell Allah short, so I'm not going to give in to some sort of a sin or some sort of a uh, a personal desire, and I'm not going to sell sell my religion and sell my God and gain this particular desire that I was after. So, not selling Allah short, right? This is this is a good explanation of what taqwa is. Let's say, right? So, um, this this idea of holding fast to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and not selling Him short in my 24 hours, right? If I if this occurs for me, if taqwa occurs for me in my 24 hours, in different increments, and so on and so forth, so on and so forth, and then it slowly starts to become a malaki. I start to become somebody who has taqwa, right? And then that itself has gradations, and I start to become somebody who is a muttaqi, somebody who has taqwa, right, in his essence. And this is important because uh, if I want uh, if I want a hereafter in which uh, I, I, I kind of, I'm happy, and my result is happy, and I'm, I'm going towards, uh, you know, the, the, a hereafter, which is, positive for now i'll use these vague terminologies right um then then all of a sudden i i want this taqwa i want this particular trait which is basically uh told to me through uh scripture that this is a particularly good trait to have right uh, when we're talking about uh, uh ma'ad and we're talking about uh, 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 um, um, our islamic belief system uh, I, as I mentioned, uh, we have a two-pronged approach towards it. We have an intellectual approach where we prove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence by means of the intellect. We uh, we prove the the need of uh, a messengers by the means of intellect, right? And then we prove uh, the need of there to be a hereafter by means of intellect. And in aside from the proof proof of the existence of these things, the actualization of 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 so the proof of God exists and th this God being Allah, right? Uh, this this you 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 come to this an, an intellectual realization. Like there's proofs of God that exist, and they talk about Tawheed and levels of Tawheed and so on. So can you understand intellectually Allah exists? And this talk about well, if if God exists, then He has to have sent with us, sent for us a believer or a guide. And an intellectual, you you start to prove this as well in Nabuwa. So. Uh, in 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 studies regarding Nabuwa, you prove this and you explain this and you understand this, right? And this Nabi, right, brings is is basically is is the Holy Prophet himself or Hazrat uh, Isa or Hazrat Musa and so on and so forth, right? This requires now not an intellectual proof. This requires a textual proof, right? So you come up with a textual proof uh, uh, about basically like now, now why is why is the Holy Prophet a prophet? Well, there's two methods of that. One is that let's say previous prophets might have proven to us or told to us that um, that previously proven prophets might have come and told us now that this particular prophet is the Nabi, is a prophet. And then we, we take that and we say, okay, this is one reason why this kind of justifies that this particular person who claims to be a prophet is a prophet. Or perhaps this prophet might bring with them um, certain miracles, which uh, uh, which basically we can't find other places. And, and with these miracles, he also has this... Um, uh, claim that I am a prophet, right? And then we see nothing has happened. This person in particular makes this particular claim as well as performs these miracles. And that might serve as a task, right? Uh, of accepting this a person to be a prophet. Going forward, and then now proving, going into basically uh, the other uh, the other aspects of our belief system, like ma'ad and qiyamat and so on and so forth, this now will no longer has only an uh, intellectual pathway. Yes, you can prove the actuality of what ma that ma'ad must exist through through uh, intellect. And we'll get into three particular explanations today, inshallah. Right? But um, um, a lot of the explanations of how ma'ad is and 
and um, basically how it will take place and how to prepare for it and so on and so forth, they come through textual proofs and they come through uh, textual advices from uh, both the Holy Quran and the Hadiths. So, so there's a true pronged approach in terms of understanding Ma'ad, whereas uh, you can and, and you can go towards it after understanding believing in Tawheed, believing in Nabuwa, right? Um, you can go towards it in an intellectual manner to prove the existence the existence of Ma'ad itself. And then in terms of proving the nitty-gritty details of what happens in Ma'ad, you require uh, basically text, you require scripture. And the scripture comes and tells us that this is this is how you should prepare for ma'ad and this is what ma'ad is and so on and so forth. So this is extremely important. This particular presentation, this particular um, 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 these particular sessions that we're talking about, they're based on now the advices uh, that, that that we have we have been able to garner from these scriptures and and the verses and so on and so forth. And and the, we start to talk about basically in San Sina Sina we're going forward. So we talked about how taqwa uh, can become a malike and um, and why this is extremely important because well I want a good here I want a good outcome I want my outcome to be something that's positive and good right so I want this particular trait to come to me uh, and similarly I want other good traits to come to me right so our 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 uh, when I'm trying to shape myself. As I said, my my soul is using this body to perform actions and commit actions and so on and so forth. And by means of this performance, then all of a sudden, slowly, slowly, I am now uh, creating myself. I'm I'm becoming a muttaqi. I'm I'm creating. Uh, I'm I'm shaping myself, if I will. Right. So, um, basically, when uh, when when I attach when I when I understand that um, the actions that I'm committing, uh, attentively. Uh, perform an action and say that this is based on this action is like halal it is based on the sharia with intent and attention that if i come go and commit and perform an action right then by doing that by performing the action with awareness and intent right i am if i'm following um the path of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if i'm following what allah has told me about that particular action right then i'm creating within me uh, a, a positive change but as long as that as long as that iman is there, there is there with the action too. So let me explain this in a better manner. I think I'm, I'm not explaining it properly. Let's say I have kids. I'm sitting in my living room. I have my kids and my wife with me. And um, I, I'm a loving father. So I love my kids. I want to play with them and so on and so forth. So I, let's say I start playing with my daughter. right? And, I, and, I, and she brings her cars and I, uh, she brings her, her toys. And I come and I play with her. Okay. So I'm... Uh, if if I'm intently aware that I'm I, I'm doing an action that is loved by Allah, and then in that action, this awareness of you know the pleasure of Allah is there as well, then that action starts to you know start to shape me in in this manner where I'm attentive towards Allah. I'm living in Allah centric. I'm I'm leading an Allah centric action in that moment, right? In that moment, not only am I just following my my faculty of desire, which is the, which is basically to spend time with kids, right? my child, make, making sure that I'm happy because my my daughter playing with her, it makes me feel happy, right? So this faculty of desire kicks in, and my intellect says, "Hey, wait a second, this is a great opportunity here. Right? You're playing with your daughter, right? Do you also understand that you're this particular love that you have towards your daughter and this the daughter itself? Both of them are blessings from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and in fact, He wants you to spend time with her too. Then this is a great time to spend with her." You're spending this time with your child, and you're playing, and you're you're trying to teach them something, or you're trying to like you know just have a good time with them, and make sure that like you know, um, they're 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 uh, they're happy, and, and you can see them smiling and so on and so forth. Well, if this is within the paradigm uh, of an Islamic action, you are doing this with the intent of you know obeying Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, then all of a sudden you're shaping yourself too in a positive manner, right? With with an attentive with an attentive and uh, intentful action. Right now, my soul is being changed and it's being shaped. Another person, let's say Bob, somebody who is not lead, leading, let's say Bob. Bob doesn't have um, uh, this particular belief in Allah at all, and he doesn't have iman entirely. Right. So um, basically, uh, Bob, when he has a child too, and he plays with his child. Right. And in the appearance of the actions, both are actions. Both are like um, we're both doing the same thing. Like, let's say we both have the same crayons. We're drawing almost the same picture too. Apparently. I said we're both drawing horses, little horses, right? So um, 
um, so Bob and me, there's a, there's a significant difference in in the action, in the in the batin of it, in the in, in the existential reality of that particular action. The appearance of that particular action might be the same. I'm drawing a horse with my daughter, and Bob is drawing a horse with his with his daughter, right? But but because the driving force behind spending that time, and then the intent behind spending that time with that particular child is uh, uh, is very self based. Bob is living a self-centric life. So he's doing this because it makes him feel happy and it makes him feel nice that he's spending time with his daughter. Right? I'm doing this particular action um, that uh, not only does it make me feel happy, but also I know that this feeling of happiness is something that Allah wants. So Allah is in the picture. So I'm doing this particular action with an Allah-centric uh, you know, uh, worldview. Right? So this particular tawajjuh, this particular attention, uh, attention and intent that differentiate between my actions and Bob's actions, right? They, they existentially differentiate the type of change that occurs within me and Bob as well. So when I'm doing an action with intent of trying to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being attentive towards this idea that Allah has given me this blessing, right, which is this child, and giving me this blessing, which is this love that I have towards this child, right? And this blessing, which is this opportunity of now being able to spend time with this child and, and enjoy this this evening with this child, right? Then by me recognizing these blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and intently using those to play with the child, in the appearance, I'm doing the same thing. I'm playing, I'm drawing those, that, that particular horse or whatever the case may be, right? But in reality, right, I'm actually uh, re-emphasizing my belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm re-emphasizing and manifesting now shukr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So this action is now shaping me in a very particular way. Because it's it's linked with iman, right? This action is being driven with iman. It's being driven with my faith system, right? Well, if a particular person's action, let's say in this example, was Bob, let's say Bob's action, let's say, is just an action that's linked with self self centric nature, not an Allah centric nature, right? Then then the sh that the shaping that takes place in Bob is the building of his own self. So basically, he kind of yeah, this makes me feel nice. I'm gonna. I'm going to do this great and so on and so forth, but this doesn't necessarily have an existential reality associated with him with this in terms of his hereafter or his belief in Allah. This, doesn't let, this action of playing with his daughter and drawing little horses doesn't get him closer to Allah right? because attentively he hasn't tried to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So this brings us into the next portion which is talking about the realms of existence the second introduction. So we have this dunya, this world, and then we have this realm called Barzakh, and we have this realm called Qiyamah, right? So uh, they're kind of like uh, uh, composed with, so let's say let, and a good analogy would be, let's say, uh, let's say let's, when a lady is pregnant, she has in her tummy, in her, in her, in, in her uh, body, she has a child, right? And then in uh, this child exists within the Barzakh, this, 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 this world, right? So that that environment that the child is in right is one entity but it's an entity within a, a greater entity as well right um it's neither entirely distinct and it's neither like you know uh it's, it's neither completely cut off and it's neither one of the same thing so uh, and then hence that when the child is comes out into the world basically from that particular previous uh abode of existence and so on and so forth that's one um there's problems with that particular understanding but that's one way of understanding how the relationship between the, the, the world, Barzakh, and Qiyama works. Now, um, I'm going to try to explain it in a, in a different manner and try to give a little bit more detail now in terms of what the differences are. And I think this is an important point. So take notes if possible. Okay. See, so in this world, if I have, um, if I have a wooden desk, Right, uh, I could, uh, I could, I could uh, take it apart and 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 reshape it and make it into a wooden chair. Let's say, right. But at any given time that it's a wooden chair, that it has only that one particular shape to it. Right? It has only that one particular form to it. Right. So this world, um, uh, it, it's a world of, uh, it's a world which in which basically not only shape exists but material and what that what the makeup of that thing is, is exists as well. So that wooden chair, that wooden desk gets, gives me a wooden chair. It's not going to give me a metallic chair, right? So, so in this particular world, we have uh, a material 
right? And we also have then basically um, uh, forms and, 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 and shapes and, and surah, if you will, right? So when a person uh, passes from the material world, so th this particular dunya, into the barzakh, right? Uh, their 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 body uh, is their physical composition is one that belongs to this world, which is the parent world, right? Barzakh, uh, it's not that the material of that particular body doesn't pass through in the sense that it's not that that when I when I, when when I bury somebody who's deceased in a, in a grave and let's say I I, I I measured exactly how much you know I know soil and so on so should be here if the body remained here, right? And then I say, wait, wait a second, there nothing changed. And then the exact amount of soil is in the underground and in this particular capsule that I that I measured a dead person to be in or a person who was alive and then they passed away. That's, that's a really weird experiment. That's it. Okay. It's not that a physical aspect of a person breaks free from the dunya and goes towards barzakh. Right? Physic the physical aspect, the physical body of this particular person remains in the material where we bury it and it goes through its processes that it goes through and so on and so forth. Right? It's the, the soul of this person, however, does uh, transcend uh, into the barzakh. But it's not the case that it transcends into the barzakh. Rather, we actualize and realize its connection to the barzakh. The soul already had a connection, but we weren't attentive towards it because we were attentive towards the physical and the material aspects of this dunya. We were, we were, we were uh, kind of in the car, right? So when we were turning right, we weren't recognizing that uh, that 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 in fact we we're not turning right the car turned right we kind of saw ourselves as the car we were going right and going left and straight and so on and so forth and then now that we've, that that we've take, gotten out of the car we kind of see the car to be a car and not us right and 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 that was different before when we were in the car um, we were so uh, kind of zoned into uh, you know uh, how 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 we were so synced with this particular car our synchronization our synchronization with this car was so uh, at such a high level that we thought this car to be us. We were going right and left and straight. And so we thought we were going right, left and straight. And then when we kind of exited this particular car, we thought, whoa, wait a second, this car wasn't me. It was a car and I was a driver. And it was completely, there were two, there were two different things, right? Um, so when a person passes away, they pass from this particular world and they go towards the realm of Barzakh. Now the bar Barzakh, it does not have uh, material, but it has shape. Now, how can something have shape with no material well let's give let's give a certain example you and i experience certain aspects of this right um so uh, if, if i was to ask you to imagine a tree in your head right now right so if you imagine a tree within your head that tree right um um let, let's say take that tree and now that and now imagine like the, the like like let's say like a forest now right and then now now shrink that forest into a, a tree again it's not you weren't you were, you were changing the, the the image that that occurs within your mind that you're forming and so on and so forth. You're changing the shape of it, right? But it's not the case that that particular image is now composed of matter and material. That now, when you imagine the forest, things felt a little bit heavier in the head, you know, <laughs> or when you were if, if 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 the image took place in your head, or if if, if you imagine the tree, things were all of a sudden things were a little bit lighter. Like, oh, it's much easier to, to to kind of hold on to this particular image, you know. They're both of our images. You were dealing with the forms and the shapes, right? But it didn't necessitate that those forms and shapes had matter associated with them and material associated with them, right? So here's one understanding or one one example of of perhaps looking at how um, how um, uh, as something can exist without necessitating it without its need explicitly to matter, right? With, with, without explicitly having this need towards basically the material. Um, this, is an, this is again an analogy and an example. So um, everything that exists within this particular world, this particular uh, state of existence that we're in, it in fact is um, uh, has a higher reality to it. So it has uh, so if this, let's say this laptop in front of me, this relationship that I have with you right now, I'm, I'm talking and you're listening, right? Um, uh, my hands, my body, my you know, the room that I'm sitting in, this has a physical and apparent existence, right? But this interaction, this action, and so on and so forth, has uh, has uh, with it uh, uh, an existence in the Bardakhir realm too, and that existence in the Bardakhir realm isn't somewhere far away. It is here. It's like it's like when that when that baby is in. Uh, in in that in that womb, right? 
and and it's also within uh, the mom is sitting in a room so you kind of said babies in the room too it's not that the baby, baby in the womb existed one place and the room existed in a different place and so on and so forth no you're like no the baby is in this room as well right but at, at the moment the baby doesn't understand that he's in the room the baby is kind of preoccupied with with you know the practicing his breathing movements and, and all that stuff in in that womb right right but um so similarly we're we're in this particular world we're in this particular material existence right but um uh, we don't recognize it however we are in fact within our barzakhi form as well we are living the barzakh we're here in the barzakh itself too right once the material link between this dunya uh, and the barzakh separates and and goes away then we kind of become more attentive toward the other reality which was the barzakh reality right And then a similar relationship exists between Barzakh and Qiyam. I won't get into that too much right now. Right? So um, um, building further into the, the point that I mentioned about um, matter, and uh, because this world has matter, it can have about, it can only have one shape to it. Okay. So if I had that wooden desk, uh, while while being a wooden desk, it was a wooden desk. It wasn't like also having the shape of a chair as well as having the shape of a bed and so on and so forth. It had one shape to it. When that changed that desk and made it into a chair, then it remained a chair. It wasn't a chair and a bed. It had the shape of a chair, right? It wasn't a chair and a sofa. No, it remained as a chair, right? But in the barzakh, because there's no matter, right? Uh, then the capacity to have multiple shapes comes in. It comes in basically. So in this dunya, this is what Sayyid Kamil's face looks like, right? But because Sayyid Kamil is somebody who commits a lot of actions in his dunya, he, and each action, according to a spiritual text, has a particular shape associated with it. Well, those shapes aren't manifested in this physical dunya. It's not like every time I uh, do a good deed, like say a, you know, a mole appears, or if I do a bad deed, a mole appears here. It's not, it's not like my physical composition doesn't change because of. Because of certain deeds of mine, right? Like a face tally of good deeds and bad deeds, right? But rather in the barzakh, uh, that's not the case. In the barzakh, uh, in fact, every action I commit has its shape and that shape is maintained, right? So in the physical dunya, the action doesn't manifest itself. Uh, some actions don't. So, some actions might not give it some examples regarding that right now, inshallah. But in the barzakh, but in barzakh every action manifests itself, right? Um, every intentful action that I did for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like, like the playing with that daughter or making that unicorn, that, that unicorn or that horse or whatever you, your, your daughter likes to draw, right? Like when, the, when that father was, uh, when Ali was playing with his daughter and, 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 and he had, was intentful and attentive towards this idea, right? That he was doing this for the sake of Allah and that this is something that, that is a blessing of Allah for him, right? With this intent, this action was causing a change in him. It was causing... Uh, it was causing his action to manifest in a very positive manner for him, right, in his barzakhi form. But Bob, who didn't have that particular uh, understanding and that particular intent behind that action, well, he wasn't causing any realistic change for him in his barzakhi form, right? Bob remained Bob, right? He, in his barzakhi form, that particular change didn't exist. That particular change didn't, did what, rather I should say this, that particular change didn't yield a positive, uh, a positive um, outcome. It yielded in a lost opportunity. Right, that particular in environment, that particular instance that he was given a limited resource, which was his life. Right, uh, he was given to kind of get, gain or garner uh, good results in in his barzakh. That opportunity was lost. That time was spent away from an, an intentful action, uh, getting him closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Right. right? Um, so, so that's a lost opportunity for him. And their parents both are playing with their kids and raising kids and so on and so forth, right? But they're in their in their in their batin, in their existential batin, right? They're two very distinct and different things that are taking place. Okay. So finally, some verses. Okay. So um let's look at this particular verse. Um if you uh, look at, I put the Arabic and the translation as well. Uh, translation is not exact, so I'll help you guys with the translation too. With certain words, I'll explain them in a better manner than how this particular um, uh, translation explains it. It's not the best translation. So, 
but that's the thing it's very difficult to translate arabic to english explicitly because a lot of extra meaning that are there within that particular word in arabic get kind of aren't carried through um in english or other languages unfortunately okay bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim man kana yuridu harf al-akhirah nazid lahu fi harfihi so whoever desires the tillage of the hereafter you will enhance for him his tillage if you if you if you, if you want the gains in the hereafter if you want the if you're going after a good result in the hereafter allah says that i will or we will rather right we will do all of them. we're going to increase that particular akhirah for we will enhance, enhance that that goodness for you right وَمَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ حَرْثَ الدُّنْيَا And if, if you're somebody who is going for the tillage of the world, right? What, what happens? تُؤْتِيهِ مِنْهَا We give a part of it to him. Right? وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ بِالنَّصِيبِ But he will not have any share in the hereafter. Okay? So... Remember that analogy and the example and so on and so forth that I gave of the fathers playing with their daughters and kind of now come back to from that understanding into looking at this particular verse at a different light now, a secondary light. And let's kind of re see what's being said to us here. Okay. Uh, yurid, uh, the word used there, it's, it, it means to, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's a word used to uh, basically strive towards something or to intend something <clears throat> if somebody intends for the hereafter but it's not just any intention it's not just it's not just any uh, any wanting or any intent it's an intent which is uh, accompanied with striving and working hard and kind of like you know um uh, having a plan and you know you know uh, 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 that particular understanding so it's something that's that's, that's very much associated with uh, you know, uh, some sort of a work or strive associated with that particular intent. So it's not just the intending itself, right? So yurid has this particular meaning to it. So so here the word is translated as desires, right? So we see the difference between the two. So desire doesn't have this idea of striving and working hard towards something and so on and so forth. Just I could have a desire for something, but not necessarily work hard towards it, right? But yurid. Here isn't like that. So someone who, someone who, let's say someone who attends, uh, someone who wants to get good marks, right? So they show up to class, um, or or they enroll in a they're enrolled in a class and they want good marks, right? And then basically, um, um, they just show up. They don't take no notes and so on and so forth. And they and they leave. Sometimes they don't even show up, right? This, but if you ask them, hey, do you want good marks in that class? They're like, yeah. Who doesn't want good marks? I would like get some good marks, but it's not necessarily that they're striving, trying or striving towards actually, you know, maintaining good notes for that class, coming to that class, spending time trying to uh, listen to what's happening in that class, thinking of particular things that they might not have understood in that particular class, writing questions down and so on. So, so they're not going through the learning process in that class. They're not striving towards that want of theirs of getting good marks, right? But that's what I was telling us here in, the, in this particular um, uh, verse, right? That if you're looking for the hereafter, right, you seem, he, he's saying that basically, uh, right, we will enhance for him his tillage. Let's say I was looking for the hereafter, uh, I was looking to get, let's say, uh, level five, right, and hereafter. But if you're going for the hereafter, not only am I going to give you level five, I'm going to give you level 10. I'm going to give you more than what you're looking for, too. I'm going to nazid lahu fi harfihi. So whatever you, so that harf that you were looking for, that tillage that you were looking for, will enhance that, uh, enhance for him his tillage, right? Okay. But then if there was somebody who was looking to, uh, looking for his tillage of the dunya, right? وَمَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ حَرْثَ الدُّنْيَا What will we do? نُؤْتِ مِنْهَا We'll give him from it. This minha is saying that We'll give him, uh, we will give him a part of it from the dunya we'll give him. When he's talking about the hereafter, he's saying we'll increase it for him. Right? But here when he's, when he's looking for five in the dunya, we'll give him three. So it's not that we won't give him. Well, if he strives, we'll give him something for sure. <laughs> it might not necessarily be all of the dunya. Why? 
because the dunya is composed of matter it's a materialistic world but the gaining of something for someone means that someone else can't gain it when i take this water bottle and i gulp one gulp of water this particular gulp that i did means that you can't take it anymore right there is a there is an existential limitation which which exists in this particular dunya right so when it comes time for somebody to so it's not it's not that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like um is, is miserly right it's not the case that allah is saying that if you want the hereafter then we'll give you lots and lots uh, and if you want this dunya we can give you lots and lots but we won't that's not, that's not what's happening here it's, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not bakhil right he is you know he is uh, the greatest of givers but the thing that we're asking for itself has a limitation, an existential limitation placed within it. And this verse is kind of pointing that out to us. And that here, look, listen, if you're going towards the tillage of the hereafter, there, there is a capacity to increase. In, and believe me, me as, 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 as a kind Lord and a kind Rabb, I want to give you the most I can. And you will get, and from this hereafter, you will get, you know, we will increase, lahu fi harfihi, right? We'll increase for him. His tillage. He was only after five. I, I'm going to give him more than that, right? Because there's a capacity to do that in that particular thing that he's de uh, desiring and wanting and so on and so forth. Right? But in this dunya, there is an existential limitation of the dunya. If I'm if I'm going towards uh, the tillage of the world, right, there's an existential cap that that, that basically exists, an existential handicap that exists, which is matter, which is the material existence, something that is. A limited in terms of time and space and, and position and ownership and so on and so forth too, right? Once, as I, get, as I said, once I consume this particular water bottle or this particular water from this water bottle, I hope I didn't consume the water bottle. Once I consume the, that, that gulp of water, right? right? Then all of a sudden, um, you, you can't have it. Right? Someone else can't have it and so on and so forth. I've used it. So having this understanding, um, we have to know that um, we, are, we are created in this dunya. We are given our 24 hours. We're giving our li given our life to lead, right? In, in the Islamic worldview, a person comes and is supposed to use this life with intentful actions, try to shape himself, right? Try to bring himself closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And... Um, if he has this uh, intent towards the akhirah, if he has this yuridu harf al akhirah, so if when does this intent take place? Intent take place in his dunya, right? In his twenty-four hours. So when he's committing that particular action, if he is intentful of the hereafter, if he is trying to gain the hereafter by means of the specific action that he's committing, right? Then the effect that that particular action is to have on his soul, then that, that that will be increased. That Allah will add to that. Allah will benefit that to a person. That 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 thing is is they getting like a booster? They go to the gym, working out once, but but the result is like the result of four workouts, you know, <laughs> like a booster basically. Without the pain, you get the gains, right? So it's like let's say that if you're going after the hereafter, right? If you're going after um, uh, if you're going after the tillage of the hereafter, so with intent you're performing your actions, right? Then all of a sudden, I'll boost it for you. Nazid lahu fil akhirah. Sorry. But if you're somebody who doesn't have that intent, intention and the intentiveness towards the actions uh, and their linkage to the hereafter, right? If you don't have that, then what do I do? What's, what's, what's going to happen? Well, there's an existential limitation in the dunya, right? Your actions ended when you performed them in the dunya. So when you, you were trying to please yourself and, and please that daughter and draw those unicorn and draw those horse, horses and so on and so forth, Right, when that action took place, it had a start, it had an end, and once the action ended, uh, it might have created a little bit of emotional attachment between you and your daughter. But that's about it. When you passed away, when my daughter passes away, a hundred years later, two hundred years later, so on and so forth, that didn't create an existential shadow on your soul. You didn't existentially develop from that and got closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, because that particular action that was committed in this dunya was limited to the dunya. It was a it was a dunya the action. It was an action that remains within the dunya, the effects of it. Right? It wasn't something that allowed this person to now elevate and get closer to Allah because it didn't have the intent towards that. Right? The the shape, the, the internal our internal shape that we were going towards 
was driven by that iman, right? In that particular, remember those three blocks that were on, on one of the sides? So that shape, that, that third block here, that shape that was being changed, my soul that was being existentially changed, right, was dependent upon iman being there. When iman was there along with my actions, then it was causing positive change in my body, in my soul, right? Okay. So then this concept that we have of the deeds of a person being recorded, well, then let's revisit this particular concept and understand what's going on, right? So we're create, we're, we're perform, our soul is performing actions by means of the body, right? And this particular action is now creating, uh, is, is causing a, an existential change, really, right? For, within our soul itself, right? And uh, then what happens after that? Because it's an existential change within our body it becomes us right so it's not that our existence is now separate from this particular action it, it becomes us right and then an understanding of the book of deeds or or, or, or this idea of, of things being written is that we're writing basically now on our own existence right so our, our ex existentially we, we end up we end up being uh, we, we end up writing what we did right so here let me give another analogy to explain this particular concept better Let's say I you see me right now and I say, hey, inshallah, I'm gonna take I'm going away for for three months on a on a on a on like a exercise routine program thing and I'm gonna go on a diet and I'm gonna try to get fit and, and get really, really muscular, right? And after I after let's say you see me three months later, uh, this program was for three months, let's say, or six months or whatever the case may be, right? And then you see me that and after that a particular amount. Just by seeing me and how I look and so on and so forth, you can kind of garner if what I was doing, um, you know, if I was successful in that or not. Kind of written on the book of my existence, right, what I did in those particular six months. If you see me that I have actually, instead of losing me a gain, you should probably be asking, hey, like, what do you want to die? What did you do? Right? Um, did you go on a seafood diet? And you basically ate everything you saw. <laughs> what happened? Um, Similarly, when we're performing our actions, we're, and we're actually um, going through the dunya, right? We are existentially shaping our own selves and our own soul. So, if my uh, intent, if my action was an intentful action, uh, we had this idea that I want to get closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala by means of this particular action, right? If I had this tawajjuh, this intent, and this understanding and this attention to it while I was doing, while I was performing the action, my niyyah was there. Right to get closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, then all of a sudden, then my, uh, my my soul is existentially taking shape. It's existentially, you know, benefiting from that particular action. Right. So if I didn't have that for whatever instance, I didn't end up having that. Right. I I lost. It was lost opportunity. Right. I, 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 my soul doesn't uh, take that positive effect. God not God forbid. If I commit a particular action and I had ill intent towards it, like I knew something, I know that, for example, I shouldn't be doing item X or item Y or this action or that action, but I end up performing that action while knowing that this action is something that doesn't not like by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Then I have a significantly negative impact on my soul. Existentially, I end up becoming that, 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 that particular negative action, that particular negative change. I, I, I create an existential link between that and my soul itself. Right, so uh, I end up then becoming the book, my book of deeds. Right, so I I am existent. I'm I am uh, I am basically the existential book of deeds. Then. Right, so when I pass away, my my soul itself is what it committed. Right, those actions, as I, as I mentioned before, they are a manifestations. Now they are manifestations of what I was doing, how I was behaving, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, there are so let's. Let's, let's look at a philosophical approach to it. Uh, so more aqli uh, methodology towards this, and then we'll go towards uh, a different approach too. So we are the creators of our own action, right? So we are, so the same concept I explained at a, at a level of just like, basically in a, in a very basic manner, right? Um, um, without necessarily throwing in a lot of um, uh, uh, details and so on and so forth. But now I want to take it one step further and explain it, the similar idea of how our actions lead to an existential change within us um, and and how basically this is, this is how our deeds 
are recorded really right in a, in a little bit more philosophical manner right and we'll end it there for today inshallah well, that's um, that leads us to just at the beginning of ihtadar so the next topic that, will, that should be covered is this topic of ihtadar of like basically uh, that that uh, that moment when you're you're when you're separating or going from the dunya to the hereafter, right? Okay, so we are the creators of our actions. So basically, um, I soul uses that, and when I say creators of our actions, I've explained the mechanism for that. So I want to repeat that. Right. So with the um, with the performance of an action, now we have we have basically. Uh, added to an, our existence right so we brought into existence a creation this creation is that particular action and that particular action in this world has a starting point and an ending point which is the appearance of that action so drawing that that, that horse with my daughter was had a starting point and an end point and so on and so forth right but because an action is not just that it's not just a physical form right it's not just the coloring on the piece of paper and the sitting with my daughter because the action is so much more than that, it has intent behind it as well, right? Then therefore, the duration of this particular action is also uh, also has to be uh, taken into consideration that other aspect of the action, which is the intent behind the action, the focus why the action was performed for, and what it was, and 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 the 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 source of the action actually, right? So now the source of that particular action, if it's something that's linked with the hereafter, right? Then, uh, then, 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 then the action doesn't end there, right? Because that that drive and that particular linkage prevents it from just being something limiting to the limiting to the physical world, right? That particular um, that particular action having an aspect of uh, the hereafter associated with it in its existence in this dunya, right? It gives that action an existential link with the hereafter. So now that action has an existential link with the hereafter. Um, and that allows for the action now to now transcend not just its physical appearance, its physical manifestation, right? It, it allows the action to transcend that and be something that actually causes now a existential change in something much greater than the physical world. It causes a change on my soul, which is an eternal soul. So the 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 limited and the constraint and the and the and the and the uh, and the apparent action performed in this dunya in the twenty four hours, right now existentially changes the soul because it has this 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 relationship of 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 illa and ma'dud. It has this relationship of cause and effect between it and the soul, so the body, the soul, and the action itself that's produced from the body and the soul. And then this particular action being performed, having that linkage about the hereafter causes that change. Okay. So we've brought into being a creation, uh, uh, basically onto our own existence. Uh, so, and, and that particular thing is causing now a change within our, our, our person, right? So, um, So if we if we look at if we look at now this action that we performed, right? If it exists, if it was an action that we committed enough times, right? Then uh, remember that we talked about this idea that if you commit an action once, so if you if you display bravery once, you display bravery twice, you keep displaying bravery, slowly you become somebody who is brave, right? Now we build that concept in here now too. So let's say I performed a particular action and it creates creates an existential shadow on my soul, right? But then all of a sudden, if I complete, if I repeat this particular action throughout my life, slowly, slowly, right, I solidify that particular shape and that change in my soul, right? So it's not that that uh, my my soul had uh, had one spray of that 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 spray tool that Microsoft Paint has. Either someone held on to it and it became darker and darker and darker, and that particular malake uh, occurred. That particular attribute was formed on my soul, right? And then when that particular attribute was formed on my soul. Right? then I became uh, that, that that soul uh, existentially was uh, was basically harnessing that particular or holding that particular attribute right then 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 when that soul has that attribute to it then it's not like a person wearing a cloth basically me wearing this particular shirt right right this particular clothing that I'm wearing 
right? The clothing is separate from me, right? It's something that I can take off and take on and so on and so forth and, and wear different types of clothing clothing on top. Um, so so there's a different different with difference between that particular clothing and myself. Right? Similarly, if I perform that bravery once or twice or three times, it doesn't necessitate that I'm a brave person. It's just I just displayed bravery once or twice or three times and so on and so forth, right? But when I display bravery enough times, then that bravery starts to become part of who I am. And then when it becomes part of who I am, right, then I can call myself a brave person. Okay? Similarly, when I when I commit that particular action intentful towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout my 24 hours, the more I perform that particular action, right, where I'm holding on to Allah, where I'm holding on to taqwa, really, right? I'm not trying to sell Allah short in my 24 hours, right? Intentfully I'm performing those actions then I'm existentially causing a change in my soul, right? I'm existentially causing now my soul to, to, to be an owner of that particular um, uh, trait, right? And it's not that that trait is separate from the soul, rather the soul becomes it, right? The soul manifests that particular trait. So then there's no distinction. So when, when now when you go into the hereafter, let's say, and you cross that material world, which was limited in its, uh, in this idea of having matter and so on and so forth, when the soul uh, actualizes itself into barzakh and you recognize that actually the soul existed beyond just the material, right? Because you uh, caused a change in the soul by means of that that world, right? That change remains in the barzakh, right? So if you committed certain actions and you manifested certain traits within this dunya, perhaps those traits weren't shown in the dunya but they end up showing in the hereafter. And that's where we have these narrations where we say that somebody who has a particular trait, uh, well, they look like this on, on the Day of Judgment. Or uh, if somebody has this particular trait, they look like that on a particular uh, on the Day of Judgment. Or for example, we have this idea that if someone does riba, um, we have it within our ahadith, that if somebody performs riba, it's like he's eating the, the meat of his, uh, his brother's dead body, right? So, so this this image that you get of somebody eating the meat of brother's dead body, well, this image, this shape, and this this shape exists beyond the physical world, right? In the physical world, riba looks like riba. Like two people sitting down doing gossiping, right? One person talk, talk, talking about the defects of a third person to this other guy, right? And sitting down in the corner and doing riba looks like that in the physical world, right? But the Ahlbayt have told us through, through these ahadith, and listen, that might be the apparent shape that this particular action takes in this dunya because this dunya is limited in how many action, how many sh shapes can be displayed by each item in this dunya so this action this particular shape is displayed but no existentially the effect that it has on your soul is entirely different there's a different shape that your body takes right it's that shape of somebody eating the 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 meat of basically their dead brother's body right that particular shape takes place in your soul and when you transcend from the bars from the dunya into the barzakh, right? You basically just you kind of uh, realize that you all, you were somebody who was an owner of that particular shape, right? Similarly, if somebody has uh, some somebody eats haram, uh, somebody steals some something and then eats something uh, eats that from that particular soul and property, right? So in fact, they've put hellfire in their stomach. Right? But but in this dunya, they don't see that. They, they, what they see is, I put pizza down my tummy. I bought this pizza from the money I stole. Or I stole the pizza itself, apparently. Perhaps it's a, right? so this person's like, oh, I just, I, in the apparent world, right? I don't, I, don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. What's hellfire? I'm putting this pizza in my mouth, and I'm chewing it, and it goes in my tummy. It's just like any other pizza. right? But as I've explained so far, how intent and how an action has more than just an apparent form to it, and the different forms that an action has, uh, yield in the action existing beyond just this particular dunya. So now eating that particular pizza caused an existential change within the soul of that stolen pizza, caused an existential change in the, in the soul of the person who did it, right? And that change stays, right? That soul, because it's eternal, once changed, right? And, and, and once the opportunity to change has been taken away, which means death has come up, right? Now we're going into ihtadah. Once the opportunity to change has been taken away, then that which remained on that canvas stays. Right. So, uh, in in a in a short summary of the things that we talked about today, before I conclude the class, 
for today is that um, um, our 24 hours are opportunities for us to uh, use them as means of causing a positive change on our soul such that our soul, uh, which is eternal, can take that eternal change with it. Right? We want the we want the occurrence of these positive actions, intentful actions towards Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, to occur uh, so frequently within this particular life that we've been giving within the twenty four hours that we have, right? Such that these actions existentially create a change within our soul, that that change isn't a one off change. That it's not like a display of bravery, right? Rather, it becomes the soul embodies that particular change itself entirely, so that change can last. It can it can remain eternal, just like that particular soul is eternal, right? But if I don't, uh, if I don't manifest th those actions and, and and have that particular focus enough, such that I create that existential change to be solidified on my soul, and my soul doesn't take the doesn't manifest that particular uh, attribute, doesn't have a malike, a positive malike then unfortunately then that soul uh, uh when, once once i depart from this particular dunya and i go from this particular dunya right well i didn't create an, an eternal change in this particular soul right and then i can't benefit from that particular eternal change so so not having that intent and not having that attention towards my actions is something that yielded in uh in in perhaps some change but 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 to gain that eternal change from this particular soul, I have to make sure that that particular ch change is something that's like, as I said, an example of bravery. It's not just a display of bravery, display of bravery. Rather, I became a brave person, right? And 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 acquiring that particular trait now uh, um, allows this eternal soul to have now an eternal trait with it too. Right? We will we'll leave off the session here for today. Yeah, uh, I pray that for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, this is an opportunity for us to. Um, learn about um, both what an, a human is in uh, the worldview of um, uh, in, in the Islamic worldview as well as how um, uh, we should look at our actions and our faculties that we have and how they particularly link with our soul and now looking at uh, this idea of the, so in Ma'ad we have these we have uh, certain aspects that deal with 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 uh, the dunya, right? So the action of how our person, how our deeds are being recorded, right? So now we get we have a better understanding of what that means. Right? When you say deeds are being recorded, it's not like there's papers and papers and someone is typing and so on and so forth, gigabytes and gigabytes of data is being stored somewhere. Rather, we are we are the existential canvas of our deeds, right? And if I binge eat, let's say if I eat pizza and and I don't work out one day, and that's one action. If I don't do it a second day, it's one action and so on and so forth. But if I don't do it enough, then I can kind of see that a person starts to become overweight and obese and so on and so forth. If a person goes to the gym one day, they don't, you know, if they they shouldn't expect to like, you know, go in front of the mirror and be like, oh yeah, now I've become fit. No, it's the continuation of, and the persistence in that particular action, uh, right, that that causes the change. Now, for um, metaphysical action, metaphysical change, change in the soul, right. Uh, the apparent of the action is not only required, but rather more than that. The intent is as important as well, right? So now the the tawajjo, the intention behind performing those actions that I'm doing this for the sake of Allah, and it's a blessing rather that to, to have this opportunity to perform this particular action, and I'm leading this twenty four this life twenty four hours of my I'm leading this twenty four hours of mine in an Allah centric manner, right? That allows my soul to existentially change slowly slowly right and that change i'm hoping that as the verse said that if a person desires for the tillage of the hereafter allah will add it to it if i'm striving towards making the hereafter my goal in this dunya allah will add to it and give to me more than what i strive towards right because i'm trying to use this 24 hours as a mood as a means as a mode of getting an eternal change to occur for my in my soul not just a temporary so not just a temporary change so that, that concludes the session for today um i will be sending out inshallah an email with um certain points that are good to think about right and uh, i'll i'll post uh, I'll, I'll post two or three points you're you're more than welcome to just uh through this week 
uh, find time and uh, you don't have to give any re reply back to me or return anything to me just if you've thought about them reply saying that you've like you don't have to give me a return reply of your thoughts but if you've spent time thinking about them just uh, just shoot me an email saying that I, I thought i looked at the email and i thought about the points that you sent here and so on and so forth right so i'll post those to you'll get those uh end of day tomorrow inshallah then you'll have the week uh, or most of the week to work on it inshallah and just just and uh, you don't have to spend every day thinking about it just 10 minutes 15 minutes 10, 5 minutes even right? read that particular passage that i send you and just think about what the passage means and what i'm trying to say there okay so we'll end the session here for today um if you guys have questions or if you have comments um this is your session this is something that's important please uh email me those uh and inshallah i can try my best to um you know um, uh, you know, help out. Shalom, <laughs> <laughs>